Welcome to another family Bible study. Again, together we want to look into the Word of God in order to discover truth. Where can we find absolute truth? Anywhere in the world. Well, we know we can find that in the Bible because the Bible is the Word of God. In this study, we have been going on through the book of Jeremiah. In our last study, we went through the closing verses of chapter 10, and we learned there that in verse 24, we read, O Lord, correct me, but with judgment, not in thine anger, lest thou bring me to nothing. And our desire is that we are corrected by the word of God. That's why we keep teaching the word of God because it is that word that make, that corrects us so that we understand truth more accurately. Uh, and we should never, never come to a point where we think we know everything. We don't have to be corrected anymore. We'll never be there until we receive our glorified spiritual bodies, and that'll be at the end of the world. How wonderful that'll be then we'll never, never again be subject to correction because we will uh, have altogether perfectly the mind of Christ and we will, both in our whole personality, be perfect and uh, with an intense desire to do the will of God. And then in chapter uh, 10 closed with these awesome words, and pour out thy fury upon the heathen, that is, the nations, that know thee not, and upon the families that call not on thy name. For they have eaten up Jacob, and devoured him, and consumed him, and have made his habitation desolate. And you see, the ultimately, the whole, the whole action of the world is that it is contravening, it is trying to go against what God desires, what God has, has planned for this world, and and uh, uh, the consequence is that the law of God calls for judgment to fall upon these. Now we're going to go into chapter 11, and the tenor, the tone of the book of Jeremiah changes quite dramatically because in these opening verses of Jeremiah 11, God is going back to basic fundamentals, right back to basic fundamentals. Uh, the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord is saying, he, Hear ye the words of this covenant, and speak to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and say thou unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Curse be the man that obeyeth not the words of his covenant, which I commanded your fathers in the day that I brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the iron furnace, saying, Obey my voice, and do them according to all which I command you. So shall ye be my people, and I will be your God. Now, here God is getting back to basic fundamentals, and he's talking about the covenant. Hear ye the words of this covenant. And and then uh, once Jeremiah has heard these, he is to speak what he has heard. And that automatically tells us how God has given us the word of God. Holy men of God spoke as God. The Holy Spirit moved them, and they in turn wrote it into the Bible. And uh, then uh, all those who are true believers continue to publish what we have, uh, what we read in the Bible that has been given from the mouth of God, we publish that to the, uh, to uh, the. Uh, in this case, is focusing on the men of Judah, and the uh, the uh, inhabitants of Jerusalem. In other words, uh, uh, the uh, uh, God is focusing on those who externally represent the kingdom of God, uh, those who look like they uh, uh, have a relationship with God, although ultimately. The words of this covenant have to be presented to the whole world. Uh, and that it would be developed in other passages. But now we want to talk for a moment about this covenant. I've been thinking a little bit about it. And 
and it's it's pretty complicated in a way, uh, and it's pretty simple in a way. Uh, you have read theological books about the covenant, and they talk about cutting an agreement. It's an agreement between two parties, and and uh, that uh, 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 and so on. But actually, the uh, the ultimate definition of the covenant is that it is a last will and testimony of God. Uh, a last will and testament of God. The word testament, incidentally, is a Greek word or that was translated into English that is also identical with the word covenant. In a very surprising way, go back to uh, Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. We're not going to try to uh, solve all the problems here, but we're going to get, a, I think, a fresh look at what God is talking about when he talks about covenant. We read in, in uh, verse 15, 15 uh, And for this cause he, that is Christ, is the mediator of the New Testament. Now, incidentally, in your Bible, the word testament is identical to the word covenant. There is no difference uh, between the word testament or covenant. So we could read this of the new covenant, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first covenant or testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where a covenant or a testament is... There must also of necessity be the death of the testator. Now, who is the testator of the covenant of God? The testator is the one who, or of any will, of any will, uh, 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 who is the testator? The one who wrote the will, who wrote the the uh, the uh, last will and testament. He has written it. But now comes a very important principle that we pass over sometimes uh, a little bit lightly. For a testament is a force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. Okay? In other words, that the maker of the will or testament must die before the conditions called for uh, in that legal document that is called a will have any force or effect. Now, the Bible tells us, if we go back to Deuteronomy chapter 9, hold your finger in Hebrews 9, and if we go back to Hebrew or to Deuteronomy chapter 9, and we find this also in Deuteronomy chapter 4. We find there that it says in uh, verse 9, verse 9, and notice how clear this language is. When I was going up into the mount, this is Moses speaking, under the inspiration of God, he says, when I went up on the mount to receive the tables of stone, even the tables of the covenant. Now, bear in mind, when God is using the word covenant or testament in the Bible, he's not talking about a whole lot of different covenants. There's only one covenant. And, and theologians call that the covenant of grace, and we'll see why it is after a while. Uh, and and uh, uh, they may call it by some other names. But here God is identifying it with the Ten Commandments, the tables of the covenant which the Lord made with you, then I abode in the, in the mount forty days and forty nights. I neither did eat bread nor drink water. And the Lord delivered unto me two tables of stone, written with the finger of God. Okay, who is the testator? Who is the testator? Written with the finger of God. And on them was written according to all the words which the Lord spake with you, in the mount out of the midst of the fire in the day of assembly. And it came to pass at the end of forty days and forty nights that the Lord gave me the two tables of stone, even the tables of the covenant. 
Okay. We have here, therefore, named the writer or the testator of the testament or the covenant. And we have what is the covenant. Now, the Ten Commandments represented the whole Word of God. The, the whole Bible is spoken of as a covenant. We see this right on the, uh, on the, uh, 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 as we look at our Bibles, we have an Old Testament, a New Testament. Old covenant, New covenant. Covenant is an integral part. Uh, uh, and when we talk about uh, the name, the, the, the telling us what the Bible is, this is the covenant of God. Even as God wrote with his finger the ten, the ten, uh, the ten commandments, he wrote the whole Bible. This is the covenant. Now let's go back to Hebrews 9. Hebrews 9. And this is a shocking statement. For a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is a force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. And we understand that very readily. Here somebody has written a will. And in that will, he decided to give uh, some of his money here and some of his money there. And he's uh, decided a whole lot of different things. See how what is to happen to all the property that he ever no owned? Has that will any legal authority of any kind as long as he is still living? And the answer is no. No, it has no binding. Uh, it no, has no binding uh, effect on anyone or any of its conditions until the day he dies. But once he dies, that will becomes a legal document that cannot be broken. Now, unfortunately, on today's scene, with all the avarice, with all the greed that, that is going on in families and so on, they hear the will read and they feel like uh, uh, they're a son or a daughter or an, or an uncle or an aunt or a nephew or a niece or something, and uh, they feel like they've been shortchanged, and the next thing they're going to attack the will and see if they can't find a defect in the in that last will and testament uh, and uh, neutralize it or nullify it in some way. But that's 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 another subject. But the, the fact is, that will is a legal document, and it has to be honored. And uh, if, they, if you were only dealing with decent people, that's the way it would be honored altogether. Okay, well, but now God is calling the Bible a covenant. And Christ didn't die until 2,000 years ago when he went to the cross. A test testament cannot have any effect until the testator dies. Christ had to die. So all the people in the Old Testament were not under the authority of the law of God. Because the covenant is the law of God. We saw that, wasn't didn't we? The Ten Commandments. And, and uh, as you go, you read again and again and again in the Bible about uh, you have broken my covenant. You have, and so on and so on. The key verse. And now we see how enormously important this verse is. Is Revelation 13 verse 8. This verse just becomes e enormously important in emphasizing again that everything in the Bible has to be looked at carefully. Nothing can be looked at casually. Because here we read in verse 8, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. And it's, it's, in, a, it's in a very different setting. It's in a very different setting. It's in the setting of of uh, the end of the church age when the churches are overrun by by uh, false gospels and Satan is ruling there and uh, he is the beast that comes out of the sea he's the beast that comes out of the earth and uh, and uh, uh, he is the one that is being worshiped and then uh, almost as an afterthought almost as if uh, as if it was just kind of added uh, incidentally it says 
All those whose names were not written in the book of the life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. That statement is one of the most important statements in the whole Bible. And the curious thing is, this is not stated as simply as this anywhere except here. It's just in this one verse. And if we do not read the Bible carefully, we even, we would miss this. It, you know, it just, if, if we weren't familiar with the book of Revelation and we were, uh, we're really working in Hebrews chapter nine, the death of the testator is required, uh, and, and, uh, and the Bible is the covenant. In fact, in fact, this whole subject is so confusing in the minds of men that that I know in my own personal life, I have struggled through the years trying to understand, really, what is the covenant? What is the covenant? Uh, and uh, finally, years ago, I decided, well, it's the whole gospel. I was getting very, very close to truth. But actually, we can even be more definitive. It is the whole law of God. And the gospel is the law of God, of course. Now, because how is it that Christ is the lamb slain from before the foundation of the world? Only, and this ties us back to, oh, remember in Exodus chapter 4, in Exodus chapter 4, remember when, uh, when uh, 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 God is sending, uh, or Exodus chapter 3, when God is sending Moses to, uh, to uh, Egypt, to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt, the nation of Israel out of Egypt. He's saying, whom shall I say sent me? Moses is asking God. And that curious answer, Moses, uh, in verse 13 of Exodus 3, And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers has sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, what is his name? What shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am has sent me unto you. What is that saying? Well, that is a, a name God is assigning to himself that is describing a very necessary piece of information, a very necessary characteristic in order to make God's whole plan of salvation work. Because if God was not from everlasting past, if he was not the ever-present one, then it would be impossible to, for Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, to be true, when God says that Christ is the Lamb slain from before the foundation of the world. Because there is no record anywhere in the, in the law of God, in the covenant, that describes that before the foundation of the world, Christ physically, literally, or God in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, physically or literally had taken upon himself the sins of all those that he had planned to save, and there was a great uh, commotion going on as God poured out his wrath on him, and so on. That's not in the Bible anywhere. And the Bible, on the other hand, describes this in minute detail when we come to Christ going to the cross. And uh, he's in there in the Garden of Gethsemane. Abba, Father, is it possible that this cup might pass from me? He is, uh, the sweat is pouring off his body like great drops of blood into the ground. We know that that is where he is being slain. That is where he is enduring the second death. And yet, we, and we know the time. We know it was on Passover day in the year A.D. 33, about 2,000 years ago. We know those things. We know that the world existed 11,000 years uh, uh, prior, at, at it had an existence, and there were countless people who lived and died during the, these 11,000 years. And so, how can it be that this covenant had any 
any legal effect on them if it requires the death of the testator. And Christ legally and definitely endured physically, literally, uh, in principle, eternally designed, uh, endured the eternal wrath of God 2,000 years ago. But this passage of Exodus 3, where God says, I am, I am. And remember when Jesus came out of the Garden of Gethsemane, what did he say when he was asked, are you Jesus? What was, what was, what was his answer? I am, I am. You see, uh, he is enduring, already enduring the wrath of God. He is the Lamb slain from before the foundation of the world because he is ever present. What happened to him 2,000 years ago in principle had all met all the legal requirements from the very moment that man fell into sin. So that the covenant, the testament, the will, the last will and testament became a legally effective document from the very beginning of time. It, it was already a legally effective document. If, if Christ had not been the, the great I Am, if he was not the Lamb slain from before the foundation of the world, then only those who lived after Christ came would would be under the obligations of the law of God. And we'd have something else to worry about for all those people that lived the previous 11,000 years. But because Christ is the great I am, the lamb slain uh, from the foundation of the world, and he was slain as the testator, the writer of the will, he demonstrated this on Mount Sinai, when he wrote with his finger, he demonstrated it in Jeremiah and in some of these other passages where he gave his law, he gave his word. So the whole law of God stands for us today. And, uh, and uh, uh, the, uh, the fact that Christ died means that the terms of the law of God, all the conditions of the law of God, everything in the law of God have to be carried out. That's why again and again the Bible talks about the blood of his covenant, the blood of his covenant, the blood refer referring to the fact that Christ died. Christ died in order to be the maker of the, or the, or to, to give legal legal uh, uh, effect for his law for the for the for the testament for the law that he had written all right now let's go back to jeremiah 11 and see how uh, what else we can learn here in jeremiah 11 we read hear ye the words of this covenant now what is the covenant the whole law of god it's God's covenant. It's God's law. It's God's will and testament. He is the testator. He is the one that has died and has made it uh, the the all the the legal statements and the whole Bible is a system of laws and commandments and statutes, and therefore they all are effective because Christ is the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world, and uh, therefore these laws must be obeyed. Of course, that obedience also applies to God himself. He has to carry out the terms of the covenant, namely that he has to be the one who is uh, uh, who uh, will have paid for our sins, although he had already done that as the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Uh, uh, and, and, now, uh, 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 and now he has to carry out his whole plan of saving the elect, of getting the gospel out, and so on. But he, uh, but we created in the image of God are under the authority of that covenant. We're not going to have time to go on with this study, even though it begins to get fairly interesting to us. 
We will continue this in our next study, the Lord willing.